My name is Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd. But we're not like them. We're part of a new species that isn't afraid to do things differently. I call us FOMO sapiens. And this is the show where you'll meet people like us, phenomenal FOMO sapiens, to learn how they find the courage and the ideas to live exceptional lives. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome back to another episode of FOMO Sapiens, the show for people who don't just follow the crowd, but instead take their own path to success in business and in life. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, venture capitalist by day, author and podcaster by night, and of course, FOMO Sapiens 24-7. And today we're going to unpack the art world through the perspective of an economist, and he's a German economist, so he's even more, I don't know, economist e than the than the typical economist because you know he just sees things in a very clear way and his name is Magnus Resch and he just came out with a new book called How to Become a Successful Artist. Now Magnus is a PhD. He is an art market economist, serial entrepreneur and best-selling author and he's also the founder of magnusclass.com, larryslist.com and magnus.net the Shazam for art. Now, this is kind of cool. Leonardo DiCaprio is an investor and advisor to his company. And if that's not enough, he lectures at Yale University and his PhD is from the University of St. Gallen. Now, he's written six books about the art market and he has been portrayed in a Harvard Business School case study and in articles in places like the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Vanity Fair, and the Financial Times. Wow. And he's just an interesting guy. His perspective, you're going to enjoy what he has to say about the art world because he just comes at it with that economist mindset. And you're going to learn a lot of stuff today. You're going to learn how you you know, you know can actually make money as an artist and what you have to do and what you shouldn't do if you want to be a sustainable artist and actually build something. And I think also this applies not just to artists, but anybody who wants to build something new, especially if there's a creative element. You're also going to get into how you can build an art collection. We're going to talk about you know what kind of decisions you should make when you're thinking about art, like how much you should pay and how, how much you should worry about how much you're paying. And we're going to get his hot take, Magnus's hot take on NFTs because I don't know about where you live, but in New York City, if I have a conversation that doesn't include NFTs in it, it wasn't a conversation. And now (laughs) the small ask, I would just ask you to share this episode with somebody you know who wants to pursue a creative career, especially if they're an artist, because Magnus's, his take on this is just so practical. And for people who actually want to be successful knowing some of the things that are difficult about the art world and how to overcome them on the way in will make it more likely that you don't end up on the way out. And now, on to the interview. As you know, I like to start every interview with the same question, and so I started our conversation by asking Magnus this. What's the most important decision that you've had to make to get to where you are today? I had to say yes to a lot of things. I think saying no is something that uh, you only you can only do once you're more progressed in your career. But saying yes at the beginning was very important. All right, give me an example of that. After my master's degree, I was looking for jobs and I I applied to the usual ones. I just graduated from the London School of Economics. So the typical career path is to apply to BCG, McKinsey, Goldman Sachs and so on. And I didn't get a job. So what do you do? And when my... Uh, A former professor reached out and said, hey, are you interested in writing a PhD? Um, I said yes, not because I was interested in writing a PhD. I was actually, that's the last thing I wanted to do, writing a PhD. You know that you're going to sit there for a couple of years and focus only on one topic. That's boring. But I had to say yes, and I did. You know, if it makes you feel better, I also couldn't get those jobs. I mean, out of undergrad or grad school, I was the guy, I I never made it past the first rounds in any of these case interviews. And then I was actually on a final or a final round with Bain Consulting, and the partner actually swore at me. And he said, come on, Patrick, can't you get the effing answer? And I was like... Clearly, you're not going to get this job. So <laughs> you and I have a lot in common. Why do you think that is? Is it just the way we think we're not structured thinkers? It's so funny that you say this, Patrick. Same company with me, Bain. I was in the last round interview. And then this guy gave me a feedback and said, hey, Magnus, you actually answered the case. Your answer was right. However, we don't think you're a good fit. No, I didn't even get that far. So, hey, Bain, uh, if you're listening, we forgive you. All right. So, Magnus, the good news is 
<laughs> Getting rejected from a consulting job is oftentimes the best way to start on the path to becoming a FOMO sapiens. So you have decided, I mean, you, you, you kind of went in all in on the art world. You've done a bunch of stuff in the past. You'd worked in tech. You had a viral video back in Germany, but you went into the art world and you built a career there. Why the art world? During my studies, I needed to make some money. And I read this one book that I discovered at the Strand mm -hmm. in New York. Reading this book explained me how the art market works. So I thought, hey, that sounds easy. Why not get involved in the art world? Also, it's very easy to start an activity in the, in the art world. Compare it to the restaurant industry. In order to start a restaurant, it's very hard. You need to buy equipment, you need to buy food, and you need to go through all the rules and regulations. Starting a gallery is easy. All you need is a clean room with white walls and find some artists who are going to exhibit there, which is not a problem because there's a large oversupply of artists. So you decided to open a gallery and what did you learn? I mean, was it, was it as easy as you thought it was going to be? I learned that it's very hard to start a gallery. That's why I uh, eventually wrote my PhD on that topic because I wanted to understand why some galleries are making money and what their success factors are. And that essentially became the topic of my PhD, success factors of art galleries. Yeah, and I, I think the, the thing about galleries is there's a million of them all over all over the place, like in New York City. And you walk around 20, the streets, 20,000, yeah. 20, and you think, well, it can't be too hard. These people are um, all over the place, and they have these fancy parties, and you know, you walk by the particularly successful ones, and they have Picassos and you know Jeff Koons and other things in, in the windows. But the reality is, most galleries don't succeed. So, like, what's the day to day of running an art gallery? Like, how how did you? <laughs> <laughs> what is it? What is it really like? Let's separate the FOMO from the reality. I wrote a book on that topic called Management of Art Galleries. And the first sentence is, don't start a gallery. Why? Because I looked at the data. 30% of all galleries around the world are loss making. 50% of all galleries are making less than $200,000 annual revenue. Now, of those $200,000, 50% go immediately to the artist because that's the regular split in the art world. So that leaves galleries with $100,000 to pay for rent, their salaries, maybe an employee, transportation, insurance, and so on. Clearly, it doesn't work. And so you decide, okay, fine, galleries don't work, but you stay in the art world. So what have you figured out? I mean, what is it about the art world that keeps you in it when it's such a difficult place to do business? I'm fascinated by it. I'm fascinated by its lack of transparency and also the potential that it has. I think the art world right now is one-tenth of where it could be at the moment. I give you one example. The total revenue of all players combined in the art world is $60 billion. That is less than the annual revenue of a company like FedEx. Wow. Now, compare this to the amount of attention the art world receives. 80,000 people go to Art Basel in Miami every year. However, only 500 people are buying at that fair. So what about the rest? I argue that we can increase that number dramatically by bringing in transparency. So let's let's get into this. You you have this new book called How to Become a Successful Artist. And in the introduction, you mentioned the fact that a rabbit by Jeff Koons sells for $90 million, that Damien Hirst has made more money in his lifetime than you know all of the famous artists that we like to think about combined. But at the same time, the average female artist in Berlin has an income, an annualized income of $10,000, that fine arts degrees are the least valued college degrees in the US, and that most artists will actually abandon their careers because they can't do it. So what is going on? How, how do you have a market where you have, as you mentioned, like this very, very frothy top end, and then you have all of these people who are basically making no money at all? There are two worlds in the art market. There's a tiny little world that is receiving all the attention and making a lot of money, and then there's everyone else. 20 artists make up 40% of the annual auction revenue for contemporary art. That's 20 artists. Five galleries are making 
around a billion dollars revenue and then everyone else starts at maybe a hundred million revenue and much less. So there's a huge gap between those at the top end and everyone else. Why is that? In my book, How to Become a Successful Artist, I explained that based on a research study that was published in Science Magazine, we looked at the career of half a million artists and their price points. And we found out that there's only a handful of institutions that actually lead to success. So exhibiting at these few institutions make an artist successful. If you're not part of this small little circle of galleries and museums, you will never make it. FOMO. FOMO. So uh, before we even get into that, I, I do want to talk about the word success means, what that means, because, you know, you think about so many amazing artists that we love today when they were alive, they were basically penniless, right? I mean, that's the classical starving artist archetype that we all think about, which is, by the way, I mean, that's not fair because if that's, if you're signing up for a life of poverty, you know, first of all, a lot of people don't want to do that. A lot of people can't do that. But but success, obviously, isn't just financial measure. As you think about success in the art world, how, how do you sort of lay it out? To me, success is three-dimensional for artists. One element is economic success. You want to make a living from that. Second part of success is being accepted by your reference group. So by the people you admire, by the artists, fellow artists who inspire you, by um, accepted by museums and galleries who you uh, like. The third element is, I call it socio-ethical goals. Um, the art world has historically been always um, a place where uh, existing rules were not followed. So working according to ethical standards will help if you want to achieve lasting success. All right. So let's get into, I mean, I'm sure everybody here who's listening to this knows somebody who wants to be an artist because despite the fact that there's no money in it for most people, fine arts programs are full of students. It's still a, a very in-demand thing to study. So what would be your advice for somebody who says, listen, I want to do this. I don't want to, I don't want to live in a cardboard box on the side of the road. I actually want to have a, a, a life as an artist. What are the kinds of things that they can do or, or they should know going in to be able to make sure they set themselves up for, you know, success? The first thing is change your mind. What you don't learn at art school is that you're not an artist, you're an entrepreneur. So the idea of getting discovered because of your art, because your art speaks for itself is just wrong. So having this mindset of an entrepreneur means you are in charge of your career. You need to start networking. You need to build your own brand. You need to reach out to the right media, to the right collectors and galleries, other artists, and so on. You need to build up your own Instagram. You need to have a website. You need to have a very clear branding, an artist statement, and all these things, which I explain in my book. The interesting thing is that none of this, what I just explained to you, is taught at art schools. Art schools are freed from any talk about money, branding, marketing, any business terminology is banned from art schools. And that's why so many artists fail. So I'd love to hear an example of an artist that maybe we can all go look up on Instagram that you think is doing a good job of presenting themselves in this kind of way. An artist who does it really well and has understood that she is an entrepreneur and not only an artist, is Maria Crane, at Maria Crane. When you look at her Instagram, you see how she is very smart about what she posts, when she posts, the story that she's telling, and so on. Um, it's a combination of her work, but also her personality, which works really well. And she shares success stories, showing where her art is placed. She names a couple of celebrities, Andrew Lloyd Webber in, in, uh, in one of her recent posts, um, which give me as a potential buyer the feeling, hey, there's demand, she's in the right circles, but I also get to know her personally. Yeah, Maria is a good example, and she's somebody that I've known actually for a long time. So I knew her when she was just out of school, and I was trying to write about art for the Huffington Post so that I would have something interesting to say at cocktail parties. And I met Maria through Dina Brodsky, who's been on the show recently to talk about her NFT project. And Maria was just getting started, but she was really cool and kind of fearless, and she's built up this this 
body of work that's really beautiful, but also she's shared with her sort of persona. And, and now you see things like she just got commissioned by, as you mentioned, Andrew Lloyd Webber to paint these incredible paintings for his new theater in London that he's renovated. And so she's kind of built herself up. And it's funny, um, we have a, a former guest on the show, Anu Dougal, who commissioned Maria to paint something for her home. And you can, it's been a, a little bit, I think she's posted it to, to social media in the past to her Instagram. And and I got to tell you, when I, when I mentioned Maria, all that Anu had to do was go to Maria's Instagram to see her work. And then she was like, wow, this woman's stuff is incredible. So it's true. Being the artist who's like hidden away in the cave, painting <laughs> and just suffering without thinking about how you can get people interested in your work, it's not going to work. And it's just like any other type of entrepreneurship. You have to communicate a story. You have to think about the market and the brand that you're going to put together. And of course you need a good product, but a good product in and of itself, is just not enough. Now, Magnus, I do want to talk about collecting because over the years, I have a little tiny art collection. And when I first started collecting, you know, I grew up in a small town in Maine. Like I didn't know anybody who had art in their home. And I thought it was only a thing for like super rich people. But in fact, what I learned over time is that it's not the case and that you can very excessively start collecting art. But at the same time, just because you can afford something doesn't mean that you should buy it or that it's good. And I know you've created a new course about collecting art. So tell us about the course, but also tell us about some of the basic things that any of us can think of as we start trying to collect some art for the, you know, for to build a collection that we could pass on even. My new course, magnusclass.com is for collectors. I want to help people who are interested in art but haven't bought works before to get started in the art world. So I explain to them how the art market works. I run them through the key galleries, talk to them about art fairs, what to be careful with when you're buying art, um, what prices you should be purchasing it, and we talk about collection strategies. So it's a one-on-one -on -one for collectors in a very condensed time based on my classes at Yale, I created this course to help people to get involved in the art market. Why? Because my, most of my friends reach out to me and say, hey, Magnus, what do I buy? Where do I start? Is that a legit gallery? Am I overpaying? Where should I go when I'm in Miami? Which fair to visit? And so on. And all these things I'm teaching in this class. Now, imagine... Somebody who's listening here, we have listeners all over the world there, you know, they go to their local art gallery or their local affordable art fair or, you know, um, they're they, they're traveling and they're and they're looking at art in the street or, or, you know, there's a million places one could buy art. What are your tips for, you know, what should we choose? I mean, the obvious point is we'll buy something you like. But beyond that, are there specific things that we should keep in mind as we're thinking about buying a piece of work? The good news first, art is not a good investment. <laughs> so whatever you're buying, be aware that tomorrow it will be worthless unless you're buying above half a million dollars. Again, everything below that is not a good investment. You could rather gamble. Their chances are higher that you make a return. So knowing this helps you to make a decision because then you might shy away from buying something for 30,000 because you know that tomorrow it will be worthless. So you probably go at a start at a lower price point. I personally buy art always below $10,000 because I know that I won't see that money again. And what do I do? How do I find art? Well, the truth is having spoken to over 200 top collectors, I always ask them where to find art and they all say the same thing. It's a lot of work. You need to walk around. You need to go to gallery openings. You need to follow artists and galleries on their Instagram to see art. And if you like something, immediately ask for the price. And if it's within your price range, just go for it. You can't go wrong if you like it. You know, I had this very crazy experience with a piece of art. So I, I, I have collected a little bit over the years. Nothing particularly expensive, and we're talking pretty low numbers, but I bought a piece of art in Pakistan that I had seen this artist in many people's homes, and one of the guys who, I was in the board of a company there, one of the people who worked for the company, their aunt had a gallery, I went, I bought this piece by an artist called Gulji, who paints these beautiful calligraphies, and it was, at the time, about $2,000, which for me was, a, you know, it was a lot of money, especially for a painting, 
and I brought it home on my Emirates flight and I was so afraid of breaking it and I hung it on my wall. And what happened was he was an elderly man at the time. And so I thought, well, I'd like to buy one before he passes away. But then shockingly, he and his wife were actually brutally murdered in their home. And then, you know, the pieces became popular in a way they hadn't before, which was really crazy to me. And so my takeaway from that, first of all, I was very sad to hear the news. But the thing about art is you never know what's going to happen because like any other sort of medium, the person who creates it has their own story and you never know. I mean, for example, somebody could get canceled and then your piece is worth nothing or they could become super famous. And so again, it's, it's, it's shocking how these things go, but the important thing is that I love the piece. And so I'll, you know, I'm not planning on selling it, but it's incredible to me how that played out. Now, Magnus, I do want to, since you are a man who lives in the world of technology and in art, I do want to talk about NFTs with you because it's a very hot topic and I'm curious, are you dabbling in the NFT scene and are you new to it? Have you been buying them for years? Like how, how have you been engaging with that market? I got involved in early 2021 because all of my friends reached out and asked for my opinion on it. I soon realized that it had nothing to do with the traditional art world. The rules are completely different. What is being sold there is they call it art. I think they could also be selling washing machines or grass or sand or whatever. Um, art just gives it a certain aura and this idea of, oh, I buy something low and then increases in value. It's the next Picasso I discovered, Basquiat. I don't buy into this at all. I like it. Um, I, I personally make money with it. I... I bought it to sell it, not to keep it. Um, what I bought, I don't consider art. Um, the overall idea, what, what implication does it have for the traditional art world is twofold. I think on the one hand, it shows to the traditional art world, hey, there are buyers out there that like the idea of transparency, that like the idea of um, investing in something and then flipping flip it fast something which the art world hates mm. but as we can see from the nft market um, this really takes off and the second element is that nft and blockchains are made for the art world it would be perfect if every artwork would be on the blockchain because then we wouldn't have this whole debate on transparency and authorship provenance and so on anymore we would know all right this is the this is the real work i can buy it this would increase confidence and for artists it helps because of the um, royalties that they make every time an artwork gets purchased purchased and resold again. Yeah, I, I, the NFT thing, I've been looking at it closely as as have many people. And I think it, it's impossible to ignore. But I do think that like anything else, there is a ton of hype. And there are many NFTs being minted to the blockchain every day. And a very few amount of those become massively successful, just like in the traditional art world. And so before you quit your job to become an NFT artist, you know, dig in, learn about the market. The great news is that it's with DeFi. You can read about it online. It's incredible how much information is out there and how transparent in many ways the market is in terms of, at least in terms of the, in terms of the, the, the way that people are talking about the art. Of course, on the buyer side, it's not transparent and you have no idea what's going on. And, and it's, a, it's a market that is very confusing for anybody who's a newbie. Now, Magnus, uh, you're clearly a FOMO sapiens. You have you have your hands on a lot of pies, as it were. And, and one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on is because you are a fascinating individual and, you know, you, 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 you've been in tech and art and, you know, it just seems like you kind of know where to be at all the right times. I'm curious, what do you think it is that has allowed you to take a path that's pretty unconventional when there's so much pressure in this world to do the usual thing? I think what helps me a lot is that I'm I'm always open to talk to people and hear and have a network um, of people from different industry. The good thing about the art world, why I like it so much, is because it it is in the intersection of so many different disciplines where people merge together, and that allows me to on talk to VC guys at the same time, talk to artists, talk to doctors. People who are buying art and creative art come from every different uh, discipline. This allows me to do what I'm doing. 
being an economist in the art world was very hard. Relying on data to form opinions is still something which is uh, not very common in the art world. So still today, after having been involved for 17 years, I, I find it hard and it's a constant uphill battle. Yeah, it is. And I think the, the great takeaway here, though, is that if you mix with people who are different than you, you're always going to learn something and you're, you know, you're going to have something to talk about that isn't the weather, which is not what we do. If you want to learn more about Magnus, you can go to magnusresh.com. That's M-A-G-N-U-S-R-E-S-C-H.com. You can also find him on Instagram at Magnus Resch. And if you want to learn more about collecting art, he just launched his class. So go to magnusclass.com. Magnus Resch, thanks for being here. Thank you. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO.